This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode 40. Wow. Yeah, wow. 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 Today's July 10th, 2009. Hi, everyone. It's Vincent Racaniello, and we're here again for another episode of TWIV. And we're back to a normal TWIV. I have two people with me today. The first is Dick DePommier. I'm glad to be back, Vince. We missed you, Dick. Oh, I missed you guys, too. We'll find out what you've been up to. And, and Alan Dove, welcome back, Alan. Yes, I'm here in the wilds of western Massachusetts. <laughs> so you moved, but you're still in western Massachusetts. Yes, I'm actually in the same town in western Massachusetts. But uh-huh. we, bought, we bought a house here. We'd been renting a uh, different place. And so we bought a house and moved uh, all the four miles. Wow, all that TWIV income now, you bought a house with it. Hey. Exactly, yes. So, you know, I figured I might as well might as well upgrade the dwelling since I've got all this cash flowing in from TWIV. Well, we can expect to see you on the Green Planet uh, redo your housing or renovation nation. You know, Alan, now you're going to have distractions. You're not going to be able to work anymore at home. Oh, it's already happened. Well, no, I, I have been working at home, but uh, now that I own the home, it's, you know, Things need to be fixed yeah. and all that. You so. want to take care of it. So when you have yeah. an article due, you're going to go, oh, I'd rather go fix the light. Yeah. And now yeah. what you'll need to do is get an office and use Go to My PC to, to get to your home computer so you can get some work done from the office. That is clearly the solution, right. Dick, you were traveling all over the world. I was. You went to the west coast of the U.S.? I went to Portland first, Did you do which science? is not quite on the west coast. Is that a science trip? Um, well, they were all science-based in terms of, uh, if you consider uh, the creation of the vertical farm as a science project, which I do. So I went out there to actually become involved in a sustainability conference, which was held the last week of my visit. The yeah, first cool. first couple of days I was out there to uh, meet and greet some people like the governor of Oregon, for instance, <laughs> which I enjoyed very much. Excellent. Yeah. You get to build a vertical farm in uh, Oregon? Well, I might not be building it, but I think um, the University of Oregon and Oregon State would like very much to do that. And would you advise them? Absolutely. Great. And where'd you go after Oregon? I came back home for a day and a half, got my uh, laundry done, and then took off for Jordan and Cotter. How was Cotter? Hotter. <laughs> <laughs> I would not her go bot her to Cotter. <laughs> Too hot, really? It was 110 in the shade and 80% humidity. And it so it's, was unbearable. it's Qatar and not uh, Qatar. That's right. Well, That's it what depends. Dick says. I don't know. You know, uh, if you if you speak to people over there, they'll give you three different pronunciations. So I say Qatar or Qatar. Either way, it's not infectious Qatar that I do know, <laughs> which was an old designation for a PPLO type uh, infection. Uh, but Jordan was was fascinating, and Jordan was uh, actually. A wonderful trip. I must say that I, I learned a great deal while I was over there. I learned that uh, 20 years ago, there were two and a half million Jordanians, and they all had enough water so that everybody could uh, contemplate agriculture. Uh, 20 years later, the population has now doubled, um, and they're contemplating not using water for agriculture, which is why they're interested in our vertical farm project. And in t- 20 more years, there will be 10 million Jordanians. So if you think a glass of water is important now, and Vince is demonstrating that by Vin- by drinking, that if everybody has a full glass of water today, in 20 years from now, they'll only have a half of a glass of water per person. So will it be half full at that point? <laughs> no, I'm sure that they will be looking at it as half empty. <laughs> so um, the USAID sponsored our trip and is very interested in uh, getting them on a water savings agricultural scheme, which indoor farming will do. By using Fine. hydroponics and aeroponics. Sure. So uh, we're excited. And today, as you must have heard, um, the G8s announced a $15 billion Save the Small Farmers of the World program. And the U.S. is uh, donating some uh, $3 billion to that effort. And most of it is intended for third world countries. And Jordan is the third most heavily supported country for USAID. So we think that some of the stimulus money will find its way into the Vertical Farm Project. That's Excellent. our hope. No, that would be great. It would. So the heat would have been worthwhile. 
Uh, but the, the heat in Jordan, actually, it was delightful there. It was 80, 85 degrees, no humidity. It, it was uh, essentially like being in Phoenix without the heat wave. I, I got a chance to go on tour. I, I know this is not part of our show, but I can just tell you that I stood where Moses stood to look over the promised land in Lake ne on uh, Mount Nebo. And it was a very moving experience, I must tell you. The spring that he supposedly started by striking his staff against the rock is still running. It's called the Moses Spring, and it's you can actually visit that if you want. So it's a, quite an impressive portion of the world. It's the birth of agriculture. It's the birth of written language. It's the birth of three different religions. And uh, you can find all of those things in conflict now when you go over there. It's, it's quite amazing. Jordan has a literacy rate of about uh, 80%. They've got 77,000 trained engineers that go around the world and teach the rest of the world how to construct. They're right on the fault line of the Rift Valley, which makes this the most interesting place geologically. Rift Valley? It's on the Rift Valley. There's, there's also a Rift Valley in Africa. Uh, that's the same one, Vince. It, it's got a pretty long stretch. Yeah, yeah. You know the Red Sea? That's the gulf of <laughs> the Rift Valley. Okay. Well, the Rift Valley fever virus, uh, yeah, absolutely. right? Absolutely. In fact, we have an email from someone who wants us to talk about it sometime. Oh, good. So maybe we'll do a show from the Rift Valley. Let's go. We'll set up microphones right in the valley in we the could hot do that. sun. We can do that. Yes. <laughs> At any rate, we had a great time, and, and there's much more to talk about, but I'm sure that doesn't relate to our virus show. Well, I had a trip to Florida where I experienced ah, yes. swine flu. First hand? Possibly. Possibly. So we went, the whole family went to go on vacation, and the first day my son woke up with fever, cough, sore throat. Huh. Which is Strike three. three CDC symptoms. Yep. And he didn't feel well. So we called his pediatrician. She prescribed Tamiflu for all of us. Just like that? Right on the phone. Huh. I told huh. her, uh, I said, well, this, I'm a virologist, and lo this looks like <laughs> flu to me. She said, yeah, he's going to get it, and you're all going to get it too, but you all have to stay home for seven days. Nice. No problem. To prevent transmission, of yeah. course, to other people. Yeah, she said, CDC <laughs> says he's got to stay home. Uh-huh. So this is a very interesting situation because you're on vacation, right? Right. The point is not to stay in your room for seven days. Exactly. Well, thank God you didn't take the monorail, at least. Uh, it's, it crashed, didn't it? Yeah. Yes, it did. So the, anyway, um, the next morning he was abs he was a hundred percent better after two doses of Tamiflu, and he had lingering runny nose and cough just for a few days. So I don't know if it was coincidental or. Actually, it was influenza because we didn't have any lab tests done. Right. The hotel actually had a house physician who volunteered to come and do an in-room test. Really? But I declined that. Uh-huh. I, I didn't want to wait for him. I just wanted to get out. <laughs> Besides, he works for a Mickey Mouse outfit anyway. <laughs> <laughs> right. I didn't ask him how much he would charge for that surface. You know, Some so. goofy fee, undoubtedly. Oh, it would be huge, and it wouldn't be covered. Hey, goofy fee. Oh, jeez. For everyone who wanted the goofiness, here you go. It's all right. Vince is more like Scrooge anyway, so he would, probably wouldn't have paid. You know, last week, I, Alan, ooh, ooh, I... can I be dopey? <laughs> sure, and I'll be happy. Last week, I did Twiv by myself, and I used a little splice of, of a s episode we did, Dick and I, but it's not as much fun alone. You, you, Indeed. Can't, you can't make jokes with yourself. Well, if you do, you're... You've you know, got trouble. That would be like your son, right? He's a comedian. That's right. Well, he practices on the mirror. <laughs> anyway, let's get going on science. Hey, before we go to science... Uh, well, this is science. Whose birthday is it today? Uh-oh. I know Alan's going to know this. Oh, dear. Uh, not mine. All right, go to Google page. Whose and look, birthday and is And look at the picture. Today? Oh. That's not fair. You get to see a picture? Give yeah. us a hint. Here's, I can't look Here's at Google a page. Give me some hints. Let's see if the oh, audience it, can it, get it um, before I can. Is it Nikola Tesla? No, no, don't do that. Yeah. In the, on the Google homepage, there's a picture of a coil. It's Nic Oh, okay. I did see that, actually. Yeah, it's good. Lightning coming down and hitting yeah, the, yeah, yeah, and turning yeah. the Nikola Te Tesla. Yeah. Interesting. Nikola, is that how you say it? Nikola Tesla? Nikola. So. Nikola Tes Tesla. So everybody go to the Google homepage and you can check him out. It's a good story on him. We wouldn't be doing this today without Nikola it's true. Right? Although well, if Edison had his way, he wouldn't let you know that. <laughs> you know, last when I was in Florida, the, in the hotel, they give you a free copy of USA Today, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> so one day I noticed on the front page this little survey. They always have a survey in the front. And this one was they asked a 1,000 adults to name a scientist and only... To name any scientist? Any scientist. <laughs> well, they said a famous scientist. I'm and, a famous scientist. 
I forgot the percentage. 23% couldn't name anyone. I believe that. So I did a blog post that day on Virology Blog. Mm. And I've got the most hits on that post that I ever got on Virology. No I got 20,000 hits in one day. Wow. I said, tell me if you know a scientist. Huh. And of course, every reader, <laughs> but they're coming to learn about science, so they already right. know. Right. It's very interesting. So if you look at the select population of people who are interested in science, they know all know scientists, but the rest, they all know who died last week. Yes. But they don't know scientists. Well, before I left, Vince, I was part of the World Science Festival here in New York City, which turned out to be the celebration for E.O. Wilson's 80th birthday. And mm -hmm. there were 40-some-odd events held around the city. And you had to pay money to get into them. All right? They were ticketed events. I, I was fortunate to participate in two of them. All of them sold out. Great. So if you think that there's no interest in science, that's the way to find out if there is or not. And, and there's a huge interest in science. But there's a disconnect too, right? Yeah. Well, the people who read, who read USA Today and would respond to the, the survey may not be the same people here in New York that are going to that, right? I mean, right. the surveys are very difficult. It's hard to extrapolate. I mean, even the creationists would know that Darwin is a scientist, wouldn't they? They should have named at least him public You'd enemy so. number one. <laughs> you know, the people who did name a scientist, the top scientist was Einstein. Huh. And then Pasteur and Curie. Really? They got a few percentages each. But Einstein was the top one. I'll be darned. And number four was Vince Reckon Yellow. No, there was no number four. <laughs> number four was nothing. There was no number four. Can you imagine calling someone up and... Name a, a famous scientist. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't. I, wow. It's just unconscionable. Even kids in school could do that, right? Of course. All right. You would hope so. I'd hope so. Anyway, um, let's move to let's move to virology. There's plenty of virology. Probably won't get all to it today, but let's start with uh, Alan's pig story. Yes. Ooh. So I I thought we were going to be recording this yesterday, and the um, <laughs> uh, the embargo on this would have still would have been into in effect until right up. Till the moment we would have been recording. So, uh, but fortunately, we're recording on Friday, and so this paper is out, and there's been some coverage of it. So, uh, the the basic story is the discovery of uh, Reston Ebola virus in pigs in the Philippines. Goodness. And uh, what happened was there was a an outbreak, or at least a number of cases of respiratory illness in pigs, and uh, in investigating it. Um, these researchers got involved in the investigation. They found uh, a lot of cases of, uh, what is the name of this thing? Porcine respiratory, uh, porcine reproductive and respiratory syndrome virus, PRRSV, was uh, the cause of a lot of them. But they also, um, in testing, just you know, doing a, an assay, an open-ended assay to see if there were any other viruses in there, right. um, they found uh, Reston Ebola virus. Hmm. Then they... You know, they went on to do a phylogenetic typing and uh, subsequently discovered that it's in fact uh, the the Reston isolates were uh, more divergent from each other than from the original virus isolated in 1989. So it was probably polyphyletic. Mm -hmm. uh, and this happened some time ago and it's been circulating in the swine. Uh, and they also found it in people who worked on pig farms. So they found that the, the virus... Um, or at least they were seropositive. Uh, they right. found that people were being exposed to this and uh, did not appear to have suffered any ill effects, which is consistent with what we know sure. about Reston so far. It's uh, yeah. it's occurred in monkeys, and um, uh, the monkeys uh, at the initial isolation of them in Reston, Reston, Virginia, that lab people were exposed and and nobody got sick from it. But obviously, this is of some concern because here you've got an Ebola virus. It's in pigs that are being raised for food. It's spreading to agricultural workers. You know, of course, the the BBC coverage of it is uh, uh, focused on the concern. You know, what what happens if it mutates in pigs and becomes more infectious hmm. to people? And it ain't no influenza virus. I guess I would raise the question of how close is it to the one in Africa? Which, what do you mean, the one in Africa? The, the, the one from the Ebola. <laughs> like Sudan and Zaire and Yeah, the one Coast. from the endemic site. Where yeah, so there are five different species, and this is the one that does not infect people. Right. And the, other, the others are from uh, Africa, and they're mm -hmm. very lethal. Exactly. Right, they've got, a, they've got a phylogenetic tree in the So paper. what's the difference is what I'm asking, because uh, is there a possibility of using this one to immunize against the others? Well, there's been um, the, the folks in Frederick have done some work on that, right? I'm sure. Yes. Uh, yeah, the problem, I, of course, is then how do you challenge without... Exactly. You know. <laughs> um, 
You do that on Plum Island. <laughs> no, in fact, right. there's been a vaccine made for the army with the yep. glycoprotein. I, I, someone wrote to us about that some time ago, so I don't, I don't remember yeah. what the outcome was, but uh, it's hard to, to test it unless you do it in some animal. I don't know what the animal model for it would be, but uh, you could see if it, you get antibodies at least to the, to sure. the protein that you put in, the glycoprotein. Now, is you that a bat-transmitted virus in the Philippines also? That's a good question, right? Uh, we don't know. And did they find Nipah virus in those pigs as well? Uh, that is a good question. They did some. They did some micro. See, I've been rain. away, but I've been thinking. Oh, You've good. been. You're sharp. You came, you came back from your break with uh, mind attacks. Yeah. Exactly. So they they did a microarray, and yeah. so I suppose there were sequences there, but they didn't say anything about right. finding right. anything else. Mm -hmm. In answer to your other question, how how difference amino acid differences? I'm looking at this phylogenetic tree in this paper. Ah, so there are 61 amino acid changes between these isolates and. Uh, the African strains. No, rest in 96. I don't know what they mean. Oh, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. So these are still the non-pathological strains for people. I believe yes. so. I don't think they're comparing them here. Yeah. 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 So the divergence for the for the entire Reston branch of the family tree is way, way back um, before mm -hmm. uh, Sudan and Zaire diverge, um, right. and around the same time Marburg diverges. Marburg, yes. To remember, these are different species. Yep. So they're quite right. different. So I, I presume that you wouldn't get protection with either any of these against the other species. That would be my assumption. Is it, Alan, is that correct to assume? Uh, that would be my guess. Yeah, so yeah. I'll look at it after we finish recording. We'll look, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I would think so, but I'll, it's probably wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all right. I, it's worth pointing out that there was an, inf it was an article in the Times in January where they reported infection of uh, Philippine pigs with Ebola restin. Mm -hmm. And so this maybe this is the uh, the paper that came out of that work, mm -hmm. and they found it in the pigs. They looked at 6,000 pigs, and four pigs turned out to be positive. I couldn't get a sense of how many pigs were involved well, in this well, paper. The question is, why would they look to begin with? What actually prodded them into doing this? There was this respiratory disease, yeah. uh, respiratory right, and reproductive right, right. problems oh, in that's pigs. Right, that's pigs right. got uh, sick. Got it, got it, got it. Now, and, they, uh, and it turns out a lot, most of that was due to this uh, respiratory syndrome virus. Yeah, sure. Yeah. They found antibodies in the pig workers. Right. Which yep. I think they also found in this paper, right, Alan? They find yes. seroconversion. Yeah. yeah. And the Times article was funny because they said farmers, of course, would prefer to have pigs without Ebola. <laughs> this was, Gee, uh, really? Yeah. <laughs> Given a choice. That's right. Given a choice. You can't sell them, I'm sure, if they're Ebola positive. <laughs> as as you can't if they are influenza positive, right? Well, yeah, so right. that's a good that's a good reason not to test if you're a farmer. <clears throat> that's right? true. What you don't know won't hurt you. That's oh, right. No. That's what you don't true. test for will definitely hurt you. Yeah. Remember, I used to work on trichinella. I I can tell you now how governments think about uh, infectious diseases in animals. That's a whole nother show. That's an yes. it's a it's a whole nother subject. <laughs> well, I think we should do a, a show on that sometime. It's... You could talk the whole thing. We'll ask you questions. Sure. Not um, a bad idea. Okay, that's our non flu story for today. Yes. We have a bunch of others. It, right. it turns out that now all the science is being published from the pandemic flu and he, some of it's come out. Um We're up to what, sixty thousand worldwide cases? Almost 100,000. Almost 100,000. 400 some deaths. It shows you how wrong we can be at the beginning of well, anything. If you look at the map at WHO now, almost yeah. every country is yeah. colored in yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they, I, I saw an estimate today that of a million cases in the U.S. alone. Well, has this destroyed the hypothesis that this is a seasonal distribution? Well, pandemic flu uh, sometimes violates seasonality. Okay. My feeling is that a normal a seasonal flu, the temperature, humidity may influence seasonality. But when you have conditions such as now when no one is, is immune to the virus, I think that, that, that overcomes the seasonal restrictions. Yeah. And that's why it's still so. Although in the U.S., if you go to the CDC site, the incidence is going down. Mm. If you look at the, the graph, uh, it is going down. Right. And um in but in the southern hemisphere it continues almost every country now mm -hmm. has had cases. And I'm sure it'll come back here uh in the fall. Obama's just made a big announcement about preparing for flu coming back in the fall. Sibelius has made 
plans. You know, they were gearing up to get everybody ready. They want to do immunizations at schools, which is different from usual, as opposed to your doctor office. And you do that right. when you when you want to immunize a lot of people at once. You do it at school because that's sure. the most effective way to do it. That's, that's what right. we used to do for polio. Yep, right. Do it right, right. at and as, school. As we were talking about a couple episodes ago, that's um, you know, all the all the models suggest that that's the audience you want to get anyway. Sure. Right. Okay. We're next, in the army. In the army. <laughs> the next story. <laughs> Actually, is, you vaccinate uh, in the army. In the army. Very good. Uh, the next article is a uh, article that came out in Wired. And it, le- it actually leads to a more interesting article. But the Wired uh, piece is called "Swine Flu: Just the Latest Chapter in a 91-Year Pandemic Era." Hmm. This is based on two New England Journal articles, which came out, which just emphasized the fact that the H1N1 viruses have been circulating since 1918. That was an H1N1 virus. And there are actually two good articles in the New England Journal, which we'll link to. One is called A Historical Perspective, Emergence of Influenza A, H1N1 Viruses. And the second is The Persistent Legacy of the 1918 Influenza Virus. And they both make the point that these viruses evolved in humans and pigs, reassorted in various species over the years. And they're going strong. And obviously this H1N1 is a direct descendant of those viruses. The, The Wired article sort of summarize this, but they made a big deal of the fact that in 1977, an H1N1 virus came out, emerged, which uh, circulated until this past flu season. And it was probably a laboratory contaminant from the from the 50s. It was virtually mm. identical to a strain of flu that circulated in ni- early 1950s. So the H1N1 circulated until 1957, and then they were replaced by H2N2. Then, all of a sudden, in 1977, while H3N2s were circulating, this H1N1 came out of nowhere. It was virtually (laughs) identical to the viruses that had been isolated in the early 50s, and so it was concluded way back in 77 that it was probably a lab contaminant. And I was in Peter Palazzi's lab when they made that discovery. But the Wired article seems to think that this is a new discovery, that it was a lab contaminant and making a big deal of it. So I just want to alert people, this is nothing new. Uh Uh-huh. But, Alan, that's the way the press goes, right? You kind well, of, sure. It was news to the reporter. Yeah, he learned it or she <laughs> learned it. And the two articles it refers to are quite good. So the, there's one by Zimmer and Burke, which goes over the entire uh, history of H1N1 starting in 1918. It's very interesting. One thing that I got from this, which I hadn't recognized, you know, the first influenza vaccine was made uh, in the early 40s by Jonas Salk for the Army. Mm-hmm. And it was made against the currently circulating H1N1 strain. And in 1947, the vaccine that they made did not provide any protection against flu that year. And Jonas Salk said, (laughs) huh, the virus must be changing. It's the first practical indication of that. And, of course, Jonas Salk went on to make a polio vaccine many years later. And I found an old paper, which uh, I will post, where he reports these findings that he said, oh, the vaccine didn't work. We're going to have to change it. And the first indication that there's antigenic variation. Remember, the human strains weren't isolated until the 30s. Right. So this is just the, the subsequent decade. It's quite remarkable. Mm-hmm. And so this paper goes through all of that and all the history up until the present, which uh, is very interesting. Now, we have a couple more stories, some to do with Tammy flu, some lab studies that have been going on. But before we do that, Dick, what is it that we have to do now? I guess we have a word from our sponsor. Our sponsors. If you're tired of driving in traffic every day to get to your office so you can use your computer, you need to try this wonderful program. It's the easiest way to access your PC from anywhere in the world, as long as you have internet access. It's brought to you by Citrix, and it's more secure than online banking. Citrix will help you 24-7, although I'll tell you, you don't really need the help. It's so simple. In fact, you can go right now and get a free 30-day trial. You go to mypc.com and log in, and they will download to your computer, and in two minutes, you'll have it up and running, and you, you can go. see how it works. This past week, I did a. they make a similar program called gotomeeting.com, and I was doing a conference with a company out in San Francisco, and... I logged into their computer and I saw their desktop and they could show me things remotely. It was fabulous. So this is a great program. Now people should go to go to mypc.com slash podcast, right? Exactly. Ah. Thank you, Alan. Go to mypc.com slash podcast for your free 30-day trial. So you can get into your office computer from wherever you are 
in the world. You can get all your files. You can even run your programs from home. You could run your email. You could access your network resources. It's incredibly simple, mm -hmm. really secure. This is absolutely brilliant. This is the way to go. It takes you two minutes to get set up. So you can have a free 30-day trial. You just go to go to mypc.com slash podcast. That's go to mypc.com slash podcast. Free 30-day trial. We thank them for their support. Tamiflu resistant H1N1 has emerged, right? As expected. Gee, how unusual. Are we not surprised? I guess not. None of us. Here at TWIV, we are not surprised. Nope. Well, there is a story uh, about, there are two stories that we're linking to, or probably three. One is Bloomberg which summarizes that we have uh, in Hong Kong one case, a teenager who had not taken the drug. They isolated a virus from him, which was already resistant. And then there was a, a case in Denmark and Japan. And in um, Denmark, it was from a patient who was using the drug. And in Japan, also a, a case where the patient had taken a 10-day course. Three cases so far, not a lot, but it just shows that it's going to happen and they will spread. Now, I don't know the sequences of these isolates, but there is a mutation in the neuraminidase that confers Tamiflu resistance. And in last year's seasonal flu, it went along with a change in the hemagglutinin. And actually, the change in the hemagglutinin was thought to improve transmissibility in humans. And this was kind of a hitchhiker that went along with that, was selected in the absence of drug, and then turned out to give drug resistance. So it's bad that we have that, and eventually it will be quite dominant. I think last year... They they mar they check all of their strains for resistance. Anyway, last season seasonal flu before the pandemic, a good percentage of the strains were resistant to Tamiflu, but not to Relenza, the other neuraminidase inhibitor, was still effective. Don't get resistance as readily to that. Made by the same company or not? It's made by a different company. So Tamiflu is made by Roche. That's Relenza true. is made by. So it's Glaxo. Glaxo. That's right. You see, Dick, you had it right there. You could have said it. You I did. would have won the prize for that one. <laughs> the prize. <laughs> so there's no resistance. Are you interested, Dick, or, and Alan, in why would you get resistance to one and not the but other? Of course. Tell Absolutely. Us. So it turns out that, so these are both drugs that fit into the pocket in the neuraminidase where sialic acid would normally fit. So sialic acid is the substrate of the viral right. neuraminidase. And the and neuraminidase basically cleaves sialic acid from a glycoprotein. And when the virus buds from a cell... It sticks to the surface because the receptor for hemagglutinin is sialic acid. So as soon as the new viruses are made, they stick to the surface, unless the neuraminidase cleaves all the sialic acid away, right? So these drugs inhibit the enzyme, so the viruses stick to the surface, and that's why they inhibit spread. So they don't actually inhibit virus production in the cell. So the drugs fit in the pocket. It turns out that Tamiflu, when it fits in the pocket, makes a little deformation uh, in the pocket, in order to fit in. And the virus, the mutations get rid of that deformation ability and uh, prevent the drug from binding. The other drug, Relenza, doesn't make that deformation. It just fits beautifully into the pocket. So if, if, it were make, if the virus evolved to be resistant to it, it would also not bind sialic acid. And the virus would be dead, I think, essentially, is the thinking. So that's why. You do get some resistance to Relenza, but much less. Interesting. Because obviously it's not exactly the same as sialic acid. It's all about acid. morphology, isn't it? It is. It's really interesting. Neat. So we have Tamiflu resistance in a couple of cases, but you know, as this spreads globally and com comes back next season, we'll probably see more. But by the fall, we'll have a vaccine, so it shouldn't be as much of an issue. Right. Now, uh, I thought <laughs> there was an interesting uh, article. Not interesting, but curious. Yes. Let's see. Who had this? It's an AP Associated Press article from... June 29th, which is reporting the Danish Tamiflu resistance. They say it is not a mutation that includes pieces of both seasonal flu and the new pandemic form of the virus. I just thought that was a little convoluted. It's not a mutation that includes pieces of both viruses. So what he's saying is it's not a case where the seasonal flu was already... It's not a reassortant. It's not a reassortant. Right. It didn't get the NA gene from seasonal flu. Uh, and so he's saying mutations with P. It's kind of confusing. I think he needs to listen he's to probably Twiv. Confused. That's I would say. Right? That. Shouldn't someone rewrite these, Alan? There's nobody to rewrite them. Not enough time, well, right? Yeah, and and you know the Associated Press, um, you know they're they're suffering because their newspaper newspaper clients are going out of business, and yeah. 
you know, they they probably have had staff cutbacks, and somebody should have edited. But uh, too bad. There you because go. the public is suffers, they read this in the. Well, then they're going to start talking about unless mutations. Unless they're not reading newspapers, and then we're okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, in the, in the in the end, everyone will read their or their own sources online, right? Well, right. the other thing, Alan, you'll probably agree to also, but it's time consuming. Is that a lot of these reporters should run it by the people they got the resources from to begin with? To that sure yeah, that unfortunately, properly. Un- unfortunately, um, you know, scientists take long enough to return phone calls that you right. don't really the time sure. to do that you're but right you can do that by email right. though actually yeah. Done yeah, that. yeah you know i <laughs> some of us are bad I, I, I think i think blame for that lies with the researchers well the point is our fault he's right because you okay. know what well i was in florida a reporter for <clears throat> popular science emailed me and she had written a story and she wanted me to look at it and i didn't get it because i was i wanted to be offline for a while right oh. and i got it when i came back and i said well i'm really sorry i would normally have gotten right, right back to you she said well i already sent it to my editor but if, when it comes back i'll give it to you to look at which is good but i agree with alan it's our fault most of the time so i try and be responsive but sometimes well, we're away well half and half I, I i wouldn't agree altogether with it because i i know that many many times they never volunteered to send the article back before it gets published well, I mean, they, in in many cases, um, this is the popular press, Alan, not the science right. press. No, in many in many cases, there's a policy of not sending the entire article back because that's yeah. max of of having your sources vet the article. Yeah, but then uh, you get facts checked, and uh, well, at least what it you, reads okay. Usually, usually, what you do is you send back the excerpts that you're quoting somebody on, or that you're where you're using their material. Um, so yes, ideally that would always happen, but in a in a deadline based world, yeah, sure, uh, mm. it sometimes no, no, doesn't. I got it. While we're on Tamiflu. I found this very interesting paper. It just came out in, in PLOS One. This is this hit one of my pet peeves, too, or <laughs> one, of my, one, of, one of my pet interests as well. Uh-oh. So this is, um, it turns out that Tamiflu, or Oseltamivir, is actually a prodrug. When you, it's Tamiflu, or Oseltamivir phosphate. When you take it, when you ingest it, it's taken orally. It goes to your liver, and it gets metabolized to... Oseltamivir carboxylate, which is the active drug that actually fits into the pocket. And it's been shown that that uh, metabolite is not taken out of sewage, and it's excreted in the urine. So when you take Tamiflu, you excrete this ta- uh, Oseltamivir carboxylate. It just hangs around. And it's not taken out in sewage treatment of water. So, so it accumulates in the environment. It accumulates in the environment. So in this paper, they since Japan is one of the biggest users, or the biggest user of Tamiflu, they looked in a couple of rivers in Japan. Actually, I love this river. It's called the Yodo River. I the Yodo River. The Yodo River in Japan, in, in uh, Kyoto and Osaka prefectures. And they looked before the flu season in 2007, June of 2007. Then they looked in December of 07 and January 08, which is the flu season. And they could find nothing wow. in June, and then nanograms per liter in December, Holy and even more God. in January. And then, if, if you sample close to the sewage treatment plant, you find more, and if you go further away, you find less. You you excrete it, Amazing. it goes into sewage. Sure, it's passing through the sewage treatment plants, and then the sewage treatment plants go into the rivers, right? Sure. And the drug is there. So their thing is, well, you know, the ducks and the aquatic birds that. Harbor flu, they're going to take up the drug, and who knows, maybe you could select for uh, resistance right there in the environment. Yeah, this is something that happens with, um, I came across this a couple of years ago for a story I did for Nature Medicine on pharmaceutical pollution of of water. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, And it's something that at that time was just an emerging body of research. Then about a year later, the Associated Press picked up the story, and they've gone on on an investigation of it. Um, but you see this with lots and lots of drugs. I, in fact, I would have been surprised if they hadn't found it with Tamiflu. Um, yeah, yeah. You can see antibiotics. You can see, um, I think, the one of the most common uh, drug contaminants in sewage is, is actually acetaminophen now, um, mm. which just rivers of that flow out of sewage treatment plants. So these things persist in the environment. And, um, yeah, you, you take the drug and a lot of it passes through. And... Uh, we are probably exposing, previewing the virus or giving the virus a preview of the drug uh, in some context that way. You bet. Uh, mm-hmm. The one I like best, by the way, is the one that was done below the uh, city of Minneapolis and St. Paul to look for caffeine in the water and to find out when yes. people take their coffee breaks. It, it, it goes <laughs> repulses during the day. Two hours right? afterwards. You so can, this is another drug that goes right through the sewage treatment. Right yep. through, right there through. was wow. um, just to 
hopefully finish this up. <laughs> there was another study <laughs> that was really amusing from Italy uh, where they looked at a river downstream of one of the major cities uh, and they were able to back calculate the amount of cocaine usage in the city based on the amount showing up downstream in the water. Tammy flew in the river. Well, Tamiflu. they also they also point out that it could have other effects on the environment besides virus. Well, we've got virus. a lot of Who endocrine knows, disruptors right? sure. and things like this yeah. out there, too. I mean, this drug is not without side effects in humans. Yeah, so yeah. It, right. could, it could have some environment. I mean, this is a really big deal. I mean, all the right, drugs yeah. we're taking, right. You're yeah. right. Who yeah, knows? and they're and these so, are compounds that nobody ever thought about their environmental degradability. So a lot of them are going right. to persist for for decades or maybe even centuries. Um, and they're they're at low levels. It's important to remember these. We're talking about nanogram per liter quantities. And yet, <laughs> uh, but nobody knows what they would do with those dosages. Well, so endocrine a, disruptors are effective at very very low levels. So sure. for the wildlife, particularly, I mean that's the biggest fear of this is to. You know, you change the sex of a fish from male to female with very yeah, little yeah, sure. right. stuff. So that's that's really bad news. Ultimately. Well, we don't think about the environment. We think about ourselves You're right. first, right? Right. You are right. And yeah, here we are talking about I mean, it's hard enough to make a drug that's effective and bio yeah. bioavailable, right? Yep. Right. Now, the other drug, the Valenza, is not bioavailable. Ah. You have to inhale it. Got it. So it's not metabolized as this one is. So I wonder okay. what... Of course, it's used much, much less than right. uh, Tammy flu, so right, I wonder right. if that would be better. Yep. But this is, I think, you're right, it's going to be a growing area of concern. And now yeah. we're going to make it even harder to make drugs because the requirement's <laughs> going to be that as soon as you urinate the That's drug, right. it's going to have to decompose within a certain amount of time. Wow. I'm glad I'm not a... Pesticide companies industry. are under that umbrella of Already, having to yeah. make... You know, yes. rapidly degradable pesticides otherwise. It's doable, right? That's totally doable. You know, there are 453 companies that make pesticides oh. just in the United States. Isn't that incredible? I didn't know that, no. 450. Wow. Three. 453. Hmm. Okay. Just a couple of more stories. There are now uh, being published, as I said, a lot of work on uh, the virus, the 2009 H1N1. I found two papers in science where the, 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 these are interesting because they have al almost opposite results. They're both infections of ferrets with the 2009 huh. H1N1 strain, hmm. and by two different groups, of course. In one group, they infected ferrets with the H1N1, and they compared it to previous seasonal H1N1 viruses. So ferret is a good model for influenza. They have turbinates, nasal turbinates that resemble human turbinates. They get infected, the virus grows in the respiratory tract, and they sneeze and cough. It's a great model, except that ferrets are hard to work with. So mm. it's not, you have to have a very I've, specialized animal I've facility. I've tried once. They are squirming. They're like uh, fur-covered eels. Yeah, they bite you. And they try, they they try to you. weasel out of everything. And stop it, Alan. Just stop, <laughs> just stop right there. You can Don't go any further. So anyway, the first paper, <laughs> they infect ferrets with 2009 H1N1 replicates in the ferret, it causes disease. In contrast to seasonal virus, H1N1, the 2009 H1N1 caused increased morbidity, grew to higher titers in lung tissue, and was recovered from the intestinal tracts. So they did, they did rectal swabs, and they get the virus out of the intestinal tract after inhaling them. It's very interesting. I don't Wait a minute. Know. Why can't they just swallow their own phlegm and get it like that? I suppose, yeah. doesn't mean I it's suppose. growing in the intestinal tract. Yeah, I d let's see the the numbers here. Uh, that's a good point. Maybe it didn't. Re there's no evidence for it replicating. Yeah. So, um, well, what's interesting, uh, Dick, is that they have three different 2009 strains, and they inoculate nine ferrets each, and virus detection in the intestinal tract is five, six, eight out of 27 ferrets, and zero out of nine with the last season's H1N1. Nice. Nice. So you're right. It may not be replicating, but it may st may be s more stable it's going through small. the tract. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's a good point. Okay. So we don't have any proof of replication in the nope. tract. But they say that it grows better in ferrets than last year's H1N1. Uh -huh. Okay? Paper number one. Paper number two, a different group. <laughs> they also infected ferrets. Same strain of ferret? The uh -huh. same strain. <laughs> Black-footed or regular ferret? <laughs> No, 
I've done a lot of work with mice and everybody says, no, it didn't work. It did work. It didn't work. It didn't work. And it all it varied depending on the strain of mouse that they were using, not on the parasite. So, so we just have to ferret out the details. You have to ferret out the details. You have to. I'm trying to ferret out the details right here. Uh, so the first paper said that the virus caused increased morbidity replicated better than seasonal flu. And the second paper, the 2009 flu, was more pathogenic than seasonal flu, more extensive virus replication. It's the same thing I yeah. like said before. And shedding was more abundant. Virus shedding was more abundant from the upper tract for the 2009 H1N1 compared to the seasonal flu. And transmission via aerosol or respiratory droplets was equally efficient. The thing that's different is the first paper um, from the uh, CDC group they say the uh, 2009 H1N1 viruses have less efficient respiratory droplet transmission in ferrets uh, right. uh, okay. in comparison right. to seasonal. And the second one, they say they're equally transmissible. Right. In, that sounds subjective, okay. actually, doesn't it? All right. So they yeah. both say they, that this pandemic strain grows better in the tract, but the transmission is different. Right. So it's a question of, it's probably just a question of how they do the assay. I mean, I don't know how you, mm. how you test sneezing ferrets. <laughs> Well, the, the transmission is done by either putting an infected ferret in the cage with another or in right. a separate cage if you want to look at aerosol transmission. But you can imagine that that's very subject. It depends on your airflow and all of that. And they're very social animals, so they, they probably kiss. It depends on your stuff. ferret. I mean, it depends on your ferret. One is in the Netherlands. One is in the U.S. They could be very different. They could. So uh, the ma main point I wanted to make with these is that you have to be careful with animal models. It's a model. No question. And it may not be extrapolated to people. Unfortunately, we can't do human experiments that we'd like to do, mm. but uh, we're not going to get all the answers from these animal experiments. Caution, when you read scientific papers where they do animal experiments, don't assume that it will apply to people. Mo I don't mice, think any of our mice lie, mice lie and monkeys exaggerate. <laughs> yeah. Mice lie and monkeys exaggerate. Very good. I like that. Okay, the last couple of papers, two papers in the New England Journal where now we have uh, data coming from the early Mexican infections. Where, if you remember, there was a lot of lethality. So here are the case data, so we have numbers to look at. Okay. And the one paper that I wanted to just briefly mention is called Pneumonia and Respiratory Failure from Swine Origin Influenza A, H1N1 in Mexico. So this is now what it's being called, Swine Origin Influenza A, SOIV because they don't want to call it swine flu, because it's not. So here... Um, so, they, so they gave it a suave new name. <laughs> yes, they did, a suave new name. From, they made a silk purse out of it. From March... <laughs> it was a sow's ear. Right? Yes. From March 24th through April 24th, they had 18 cases of pneumonia and confirmed swine influenza infection among 98 patients hospitalized for acute respiratory illness in Mexico City. So there were 98 patients hospitalized. Turned out 18 of them had pneumonia. Ah. So they had radiologically confirmed pneumonia. Virus isolated, the swine uh, origin virus isolated them, but no bacterial infection. All of them had pneumonia. Some of them died, but no bacteria. So the point is that this is primary viral pneumonia, or what we call acute respiratory distress syndrome, where the virus goes into the lung, causes pneumonia. It's, an, it's a combined virus replication, immunological reaction, but no secondary bacterial pneumonia. All right, so this is the first real report, the case report of this outbreak in Mexico. So if you're interested in seeing what was the story with these individuals, you can see it here. And some of them had pre-existing medical conditions. They were between 13 and 47 years of age. Eight had m medical conditions, and, and eight out of 18, so not all of them. Some, and for some of them, it was their first hospitalization ever. So they're not all very sick. So these viruses can do things that we don't understand. And I'm not saying that the virus is any particular, more particularly virulent than any other influenza strain, but... Mm -hmm. The hosts, we just don't understand the weaknesses in the host immune response that allow them to get this kind of disease. Those are very interesting papers in New England Journal. And that brings us to email. Okay. And the first is from Vanny. He wrote, Hi, Vincent. In response to one of the questions raised in the measles episode, I think HPV vaccines are made in baculovirus. It's yes, indeed. Great show as always. So I did a show with Glenn Rawl a couple of weeks ago. And we're talking about uh, baculovirus vaccines. And we both said there are no human vaccines made in baculoviruses. <laughs> and it's wrong. So, so Thank they, God I wasn't here. I would have agreed with you. <laughs> yeah, we would have all agreed. Maybe, what would you have said, Alan? Would you have said, no, you're wrong? 
I, I think I would have agreed. Yeah. yeah it's, well, anyway, this the the HPV vaccine, Cervarix, is a is a vaccine made in insect cells. When you express one of the viral capsid proteins, L1, in in any cell, it makes a particle, virus-like particle. So they do it in insect cells, and that's the basis of one of the vaccines. Hmm. So Vanny sent us an, a link to that, and then DDA also wrote uh, the same thing to in answer to one of your questions. Uh, about vaccines produced with baculovirus, the Glaxo vaccine Gardasil against four serotypes is made with virus-like particles produced in insect cells with a recombinant baculovirus. It is, cool. it is the first commercial vaccine made in baculo insect cells and the first anti-cancer vaccine. Opens the way for the use of baculo insect cells to produce virus-like particles. So thanks both for the corrections. It's always appreciated. Congratulations to your podcast. I listened to TWIV during my 30-minute walk from home to the lab, and I encourage my students to listen too. But do they? Wait a minute. That's the question. He takes a 30-minute walk, but this is an hour show, Vince. Which part of it does he listen to? Right. He walks both ways, right? <laughs> oh, okay. I'm sure he listens, he listens up to the citric ad, okay. citric ad on the way. <laughs> right. And then he says, could you be careful with the quality of the sound because it could be difficult for non-native English persons to understand when you are talking to someone on the phone with bad reception. Skype is generally good, but we did do a phone with uh, Eric Fried, and I, I, right. I know that was suboptimal. Yeah. I'm sorry about that. I try to avoid the phone, but NIH doesn't allow employees oh, to Skype out. So. so as soon as our budget doubles, we'll be glad to accommodate you. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'll try harder. I'm sorry about that. Russ wrote... Uh, so I read uh, Russ's email on TWIV39. I forgot to answer the last part of his question. Huh. I would like to ask, what role does the complement system, if any, play in virus infections? It plays a big role. Yeah. So the complement system can lyse virus-infected cells. It could even lyse enveloped viruses. It could participate in the general inflammatory process of bringing cytokines to the infected area. It can coat viruses with antibody and have them help them to get taken up by uh, phagocytic cells, right? So those are a couple of the ways that the complements... Many people think the complement system only functions in bacterial or parasitic infections, Dick. Mm, not so much. Yes or no, depends on which ones. <laughs> yeah, it depends on which. But also they are important in virus infections. And maybe in a future episode we'll go into it in more detail. And Nick wrote, now Nick I know because Nick is a retired professor of virology at uh, McGill. Ah. Uh, he's written a textbook. He's, he writes, hi Vince, I discovered TWIV on a, on a couple of months ago and have been an avid listener ever since. Huh. I especially appreciated your updates on the new H1N1 and love the interview with Peter Palazzi. You have a great broadcasting style and manage to convey information about viruses that appears to satisfy non-practicing virologists as well as at least this one, people who have been in the field a long time. It's a great service to virology. My only problem is that I have trouble finding enough time to listen. There's too much stuff in your podcast to allow me to multitask. I suppose I could set up a stationary bicycle or just download it and listen while walking the dog. Tell them to run it on fast forward. <laughs> Actually, you can do that. You could speed sure. it up 50%. You could. Or you could go on long walks with your dog if you're retired. Why not? Montreal okay. is a beautiful place to walk around. Also, Just watch for traffic while you're walking around with this headphones. This is true. This is true. Yep. Otherwise, you'll have another viral-related death on your hands. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> now, listen to his pedigree. This is fascinating. Uh, the first virology course I took was in the fall of 1962, taught by Jim Watson at Harvard. Wow. Then I took a course at Rockefeller in 64 or 65, taught by Igor Tom oh, and yeah. Pernell Chopin, oh, absolutely. with input from, among others, Jim Darnell and Sam Dales. These are all giants in virology, he by the way. He was there when I was there. Yeah, that's right. You were, well, do well, you, you know this fellow, Nick? Maybe you do. What's his last name? Well, I don't want to put it on the show. <laughs> I'll, afterwards, You'll show it to me afterwards. So I started out my virology life with good mentors. I taught in a virology course at McGill for 25 years trying to emulate these masters. Hmm. I wish I had a podcast like yours to add a touch of updated news, humor, and a wide range of information to such courses. I hope virology course teachers hear about you and make their students aware of this resource. You must spend a lot of time preparing for your podcast. I hope you can keep doing this for a long time as I think it's unique and a fantastic resource for spreading the word about viruses by people who really know what they are talking about, something that doesn't always happen in the press or on the web. Even if you reduced your frequency to once a month, it would still be valuable and worthwhile. Keep up the good work. Gee, we do spend weeks rehearsing this show. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Ever think of bringing TWIV to ASV? It would help spread the word with lots and lots of, as lots of graduate students and postdocs come to those meetings. Well, we brought it to ASM. 
Yep. We did. In fact, ASV is on as we speak right now in Vancouver, Canada. Oh. And I put in a proposal uh, via one of the committee members to do it next year at ASV, which is going to be Bozeman. Oh. We can go fishing, Dick. Oh, well, if they'll if go. they'll pay the if they'll pay the fuel costs, we can take the Twiv corporate jet, right? Yeah, we, <laughs> we could do that. That's we'll get right. we'll get out there. We'll find some. <laughs> We're money. gonna run out of biofuels, by the way. If you guys have the time, we'll get out there. You don't have to pay for Bozeman it. Bozeman will be what time of the year in the summer? It'll be right now, <sighs> next summer. Fabulous. And then we have a whole audience of virologists, so maybe Fabulous. A bigger audience. Maybe somebody will show up. <laughs> You mean you wanted more than 500 people that showed up in Philadelphia? <laughs> yeah, anyway, right. thanks for the, your note, Nick. In fact, we should. I want you to come on to TWIV uh, because you, it sounds like he has plenty of uh, yeah w- w- wisdom sure. to share. And, sure. Um, he did write a textbook whose name escapes me at the moment. I'll link to it in the show notes. I've met Nick before, and uh, we'll have you on, and uh, you can join us because it's a lot of fun. Akira wrote, hello, men of TWIV. Men of TWIV. Oh, we need to get more chicks on the show, don't we? <laughs> yeah, in fact, I have an email about that coming up. Where is it? Yes, it's it's coming up. Yeah, yeah, it's the next one. Anyway, first and foremost, I'd like to say that I'm a huge fan of the podcast and its supporting materials. Your gentlemen must devote some serious time into making this program, and I want you to know that I greatly appreciate your efforts. I'm in the middle of reading John Barry's The Great Influenza and have a question regarding the new H1N1 strain. According to TGI the great influenza. The 1918 flu occurred in a series of waves, the first being a very mild form of the disease that spread during the spring and summer of 1918. TGI states that some physician questioned whether or not the disease was even influenza at all due to its exceptionally low mortality rate. Barry then suggests that the virus through passage or adaptation to a new host through multiple iterations of infection became significantly more virulent. You mentioned that the virulence marker PB1F2 is present in the most virulent of influenza strains, including the 1918 H1N1, the avian H5N1, the 1957 H2N2, and 1968 H3N2 strains. Has there been any attempt to sequence the initial mild strain of the 1918 H1N1 virus? Mm -hmm. If so, did it contain the virulent form of the PB1F2? You mean avirulent or right? right? If the absence of this gene in the mild 1918 strain would imply that it obtained this virulence mutation while circulating among humans, would that imply that our current H1N1 strain is capable of taking on this mutation? Aside from the stop code on that truncates the gene, are the rest of the codons present to make an PB1F2 protein, whether it is the virulent form or not? Once again, I'm a huge fan of the program and would like to get more involved one way or another. If you address my question either via email or the podcast, I'd appreciate it. I recently concluded a year of HIV research as a technician at Jefferson in Philly, and I'm gearing up to start medical school in Boston this August. You've been an inspiration to me, and I hope to be a colleague of yours in the not-too-distant future. Very respectfully, Akira. Wow. Oh. Uh, so there is no early 1918 isolate. Nope. The only one we have is from November, exactly. which was reconstructed from sequence and uh, obtained from pathology specimens. They did, a very, from they did a very poor job of freezing the specimens back in 1918. Indeed. Yeah. They couldn't, right? That's right. No freezers. So the whole idea that there was a wave and increase of virulence is complete speculation uh, because we don't have any early isolates to prove it. And in Peter Palazzi, in fact, said, we don't even know if the first cases in the spring of 1918 and summer was, was the same, the same strain. That's right, exactly. He said, we don't have isolates. You right. can speculate, but if you don't have the virus, it's inappropriate. Yep. So we can't say whether this PB1F2 arose or not. Uh, so it's a great question, but I don't know. I guess if we had the samples from early on, we would have known. I think we have the pathology samples later because the Army was taking them by that time, but they didn't take it early on. Hmm. They didn't make. They didn't store samples. Those are paraffin embedded formaldehyde fixed specimens, so they they lasted. Yep. Anyway, the the H one N one of two thousand nine has three stop codons in the PB two sequence. Mm-hmm. So even if you change the first one yeah. of the PB one F two, you still have two more. So it doesn't make this. Anyway, thanks for that. And uh, go to medical school, and when you're ready, you can join us and uh, give us the perspective of a medical student. That would be interesting. Yeah. And get other medical students interested. Peter sent a link to us about a DNA-based West Nile virus vaccine, which has been approved for horses. Right. Wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's called DNA Vaccine for Horses Holds Promise for Better, Safer Human Vaccines. So we haven't talked about DNA-based vaccines, but basically you have a, an antigen that you want to immunize, and you could put the DNA encoding that antigen directly into a host, and it turns out that it stimulates a particular kind of immunity. And putting DNA in is quite safe. It's clean, pure, uh, and these are being tested in humans, but apparently this one is going into horses. I would assume it's a glycoprotein, but I don't know what the epitope is, but thanks for that link, Peter. Alan, would you mind reading Amy's? Not at all. Um, so Amy writes, uh, since my undergraduate degree four and a half years ago, I've worked as a virology lab technician on Buggy Creek virus. And I have to say, I just very quickly Googled Buggy Creek virus, and then I had to do a PubMed search. It looks very interesting. Um, it's a, uh, it's an alpha virus. Anyway, continuing with Amy's note, I love the podcast and I'm considering graduate school in virology and your podcast has given me much information to many ideas. You've talked about bringing in younger guests and I like this idea, but would prefer a graduate student who's familiar with virology, but not as versed as you. Mainly I'm writing to suggest you bring more women on the show, uh -huh. which I think is a really good idea. Uh, she continues, <laughs> I'm sl slowly I would agree with you, Alan. <laughs> old episodes while keeping up with new ones and notice a lack of female voices. Uh, I think it would be great if you could bring in young fem a young female virologist that may encourage the current and up-and-coming female scientists. Uh, thank you for your time and all the great topics on viruses. And Amy, I I have to agree. And as you know, typical male chauvinism would uh, would do. We simply, I think, had not realized that um, that we had this trend. But yeah, thinking back to the shows we've had, uh, uh, let's see, we had one of your students on, right, Vince? Right, Angie. Right. Angie, and um, have we had any other women on no. the show? No, I've, I've invited a few others, but they haven't come on. I have I have to go back and uh, get them on for sure. I know many, many female virologists who would love to. Oh yeah, come yeah, on they're, the show. they're it's certainly not for uh, for lack of uh, possibilities. Um, no, so we will. I uh, at the, and I, I, I will say, Amy, when you when we get to my science pick of the week, I actually had picked this science pick of the week before seeing your notes. So. Um, <laughs> Coincidentally. Yeah, I agree. We, we will get more women uh, virologists on the show. And I felt uh, this is a problem for a long time, but just didn't do anything about it. So we'll fix it. Yep. And finally, the last is Richard writes, on a recent trip to North Carolina, a friend at med school gave me podcast one about West Nile. <laughs> Fantastic episode. I have since downloaded the whole back catalog and can't wait to listen to them when I go back to Tanzania to continue my PhD in the control of malaria mosquitoes. There you go, Dick. Awesome. I will be sure to pass the episodes on to my friends and colleagues who I'm sure will love the show. Great. It would be great if you could do a show on Rift Valley Fever. Uh-huh. There was an outbreak last year in Dodoma, Tanzania, that resulted in a lot of people stopping eating beef, especially interesting with the vector side of things. Would be very interested to hear your and Dick's take on this. Mm -hmm. Keep up the great work, chaps. Oh, and try to keep the humor in the show. The more lame virus jokes and anecdotes, the better. We have humor in the show? Yeah, lame humor. Tell him yes. we don't have to try for that. We do it anyway. <laughs> hey, you noticed, uh, Richard, when I did it myself last week, there was no humor at all. Oh, dear. I'm sorry. Well, we spliced some of your humor in. Uh, well, as as virologists, we like to keep our humors in balance. This is all true. Uh, stop it. <laughs> Just, you know, now we're really getting ridiculous here. By the way, it's Tanzania, not Tanzania. Sorry, Dick. That's right. What, is it Dodoma or Dodoma? Don't know that one, uh, but I do know that it's Tanzania. Tanzania. I'm sorry. I'm. Uh... And is it is it Rift Valley or Rift Valley? <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. The answer to that one was All right. yes. Keep your emails coming. We love them. We Science do. picks of the week. None for Dick. It's okay. Uh, fortunately, I was away. Vincent and I. Vincent and I. <laughs> fortunately, Alan and I. Alan, what have you got for us? Well, I as I was moving to the new house, I was packing up my books and. Um, I, I noticed a, a copy of Coming to Life by Christian Nuslein Volhard. Um, and uh, for those of you who don't know who Dr. Nuslein Volhard is, she's a Nobel laureate uh, developmental biologist who um, pioneered the use of, uh, of zebrafish and also um, uh, Drosophila. In uh, Well, she, she did not originate the use of Drosophila in genetics, but she pioneered the use of zebrafish um, in developmental biology. 
Um, she's done some very, very interesting and, and pioneering work since then. Uh, she's not one of these folks who won the prize and then called it a day. Um, and she, uh, she wrote a book, not to mention any names. No. Uh, so she, she continues to do excellent research. And I had the pleasure of meeting her when she was doing the tour for this book. Um, she came to New York and gave a talk. Um, this is a book, uh, it's called Coming to Life. It's about developmental biology, but it's written um, for a scientifically educated but non-specialized audience. So this is something that an undergraduate biology major should be able to pick up and read and learn um, an enormous amount about the cutting edge of developmental biology, which is, I've always thought, one of the most interesting parts of biology. I mean, I sure. ended up being a virologist because that's pretty pretty fun too. But um, the, the process of a single egg cell becoming a, a complete yeah, yeah. animal or human is just absolutely fascinating yep. and uh, and this is a very good account of it and it is well written um, and she uh, she drew the illustrations herself she's a pretty good artist oh, wow. um, good sketches and uh, it is available on amazon.com and I've got a link that we can put in the show notes nice. Mm, nice. Alan do you know if she was a Horowitz prize winner I do not know she certainly racked up a large number of other prizes including the Nobel you're right. talking about the Columbia Horowitz mm -hmm. prize yes she may have been. Let's see. Let's just check. H-O-R-W-I-T-Z prize, because they are, they are supposedly the precursors of Nobels, right? Exactly. Louisa Gross Horowitz Prize for Basic Biology. Previous prize awardees. I think she might have been. What year, uh, what year would that have been? I just looked her up on Wikipedia, and one of the footnotes is yeah. the official site of the Louisa Gross That's Horowitz right. Prize. 1992. I'll tell you why, because I remember being at that dinner. <laughs> no, I don't think she remembers you. No, she doesn't. I'm sure she doesn't. 1992. But I remember. I know that. Uh, I remember being astounded that you could actually work on a fish and do the same thing in fish that was done in Drosophila, that was done in Cenorhabditis, that was done in... The same kinds of studies, but getting different and more uh, yeah. robust answers for developmental work. And it was quite interesting. The uh, Louisa Gross Horwitz Prize for Biology or Biochemistry yeah. is given out every year here at Columbia. Right. And it's always been said that it's a precursor of uh, the Nobel Prize. Except that we had one, <laughs> one winner of the Nobel Prize who actually then went on to get the Horwitz yes, Prize. Yes, only once. But <laughs> once we had, uh, it was awarded to um, Stan Prusiner. Yes. Right, and then the, like right. the week before he came, right. he got the Nobel Prize, and then he came, and it was fabulous. For prions, timing. prions right. yeah. Or is it prions? Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> We've had some good winners besides Nusslein Volhard, Nicole oh, Duran, sure. Philippa Marek, Leland Hartwell, Clay Armstrong, Stan Prusner, Arnie Levine, Pierre Chambon, Robert Horvitz, etc. Any virologist in that group, Vince? Uh, let's see. Not recently. No. Stephen Harrison, structural biologist, 1990. You could consider Stan Prusner a virologist. You could. I suppose. He's beyond viruses. Yes. <laughs> Barbara McClintock. That's uh, pretty good. That's not bad at all. 1982. Aaron Klug, who was a vir structural virologist. Cesar Milstein, Walter Gilbert. Let's see. Any more virologists? Renato Dubeco, 1973. There you go. Max Delbruck. Wow. 1969. And here's a name for you gentlemen. H. Gobind Korana. Does anyone remember that? From MIT. I don't. He was involved in... Nobody knows these things. He, he was the one of the early decoders of the genetic code. You mean like Servio Ochoa? He's a chemist, yeah. All right, thanks for that pick. My pick is Microbe World, uh -huh. which is a new ASM site. It's been redone by our friend Chris... Con Diane, who helped us in Philly, mm -hmm. and Microbe World was ASM's site. It was their website where they listed all, all microbiology-related web materials, but now he's made it into a, kind of a social network where you can go and you become a member. You just sign up, and you can add links to articles and podcasts, videos, and then people will comment on them. They'll vote for them, and so it's an interactive site, and he has a directory of podcasts. And Twitter, of, of course, is there as well as other ASM podcasts, but it's much nicer. So it's at microbeworld.org. You should check it out. It's and really, there's a really picture well of done. a T4 bacteriophage sculpture created from computer parts, which is about <laughs> as nerdy as it gets. Isn't it well, beautiful, though? Isn't it gorgeous? It's gorgeous. Picasso would have been proud. That's called a ready-made, by the way. 
It's really a nice picture. Uh, this is, Chris digs up this stuff. Well, he has a couple of people working with him at ASM. It's a beautiful site. He's done a great job. And uh, so you should go and sign up and then start interacting and vote for TWIV. You get to vote on everything people post. And if you vote for TWIV, it goes to the top of the list. I have a big question for you guys. Sure. Do you know of any bacterial... Do you, I'm sorry. Do you know of any viral infections in any of the archaebacteria? Yes. The paper just published... Aha! On the cover of Journal Virology really? this month, they got an archaeal virus from a hot spring at Yellowstone National Archidark. Park. And they have a picture on the cover because it shows these triangular structures coming off the surface of the bacteria. One of the few known viruses of archaea, and it's also one that, re that lives at 170 degrees, whatever the temperatures of these sure. are. Really interesting. Sure. Yeah. So why do you ask to bait me on that or did you no, actually <laughs> no because I, I was reminded of a science broadcast that i just saw recently of uh, spelunkers <clears throat> who went into a cave that was called the giant crystal cave and the temperature in this cave it's so far down under the ground that it's about 125 to 130 degrees and the crystals of quartz are heroic in size they're six feet in diameter some of them Huh? It's the most amazing place on Earth, as far as I can tell. What they were looking for were little bubbles inside the quartz crystals that they could then access and see if they could culture bacteria from them to see if they could find the most extremophiles in the world. And uh, you could only stay in this room for about maybe 20 minutes before you started to go into thermal shock. And um, in fact, one person almost lost their life uh, staying just a little bit too long. But it's like fantastic world. You look inside mm -hmm. this cave, and there's all these wonderful but giant crystals. It's like being inside of a geode. Wow. In fact, it is being inside of a geode. But the crystals, you should see them. Alan, they're, you can walk on these things. They're like, uh, they're amazing, just amazing. Huh. So they're now, they're now looking for, um, it's, it was caused by a seepage in a limestone deposit, as I recall them explaining it. And then... Um, there's a lot of geothermal activity in the area, and there was a superheated water that accumulated all these uh, uh, rich minerals, which then crystallized the, the moment the water left the room. It began to crystallize as it, the concentration went way up, and then, of course, the crystals formed. But trapping life inside these bubbles of, uh, of water may reveal yet uh, more hmm. archaeobacteria. So Sorry. this reminds me of an old Don Ho song. They were looking for tiny bubbles in the lime. Oh, God. <laughs> ah, dear. <laughs> I see house building activities is... <laughs> you might have hit the nail right on the head on that one, Alan. <laughs> anyway, I saw... It might have been in Microbe World, I don't remember. The cover of JV, I'll try and find that. And we'll put a link to uh, sure. studies of this very interesting archaeal virus. Yes, so there are okay. viruses that... I think there are viruses that infect every living thing, Okay. essentially. That should do it, gentlemen, for another TWIV. Alan, thank you. Thank for you. For taking time for, from hammering at your new house. There. Exactly. You can follow Alan Dove on Twitter at Alan Dove, and you can read his blog at dovedocs.com. I got it right. Yes, you did. Dick, thanks for coming back. Uh, you don't have to thank Good me. Good to see you, you again. You keep me away. Are you going to be here next week? Sure. We have a guest, uh, Rich Condit. Nice. You can follow TWIV on Twitter, P-R-O-F-V-R-R, -R, or on FriendFeed. And remember, twiv.tv is our website. Hmm. Remember, <laughs> <laughs> shite. Take 43. Twiv.tv <laughs> is our website where you can find all our show notes. Do send us your questions. We love them. And now there's a new way to reach us. You can send us email at twiv at twiv.tv. You can send us an MP3 file, or you can call up Skype and you call up Twiv Podcast and leave a voicemail. I forgot to mention something. I'm the uh, featured advisor on a series of Discovery Channel shows called Monsters Inside Us, which mm -hmm. is all about parasitic infections. Cool. So they asked whether I would be willing to serve as a, a consultant. And here's a case in point, Alan, where the press, in this case the popular television show press, was very interested in getting it right. I had a really good time uh, interacting with their scripts, and so you can see their shows on the Discovery Channel. It airs at various times throughout the uh, country and throughout the world, I guess. And the first two episodes have already aired. And it's all about parasitic infections, the larger microbes, so to speak. Excellent. So that's my choice of uh, television show. <laughs> it's a TV show. Discovery, is is it 
something specific we should look for or well it's called is part of the, their, it's called the monsters inside ah, us. the monsters inside us. they could find it online at discovery.com i suppose that's it would exactly be. right that's exactly monsters right. inside us very good monsters we see your name somewhere you will there's a very special and it flies by so fast you can't see it but i saw it believe me i saw it very good thanks that's <laughs> great there. that's dick's pick the monsters inside us a okay. discovery tv series they're not so bad discovery right no they're pretty good they're a little bit sensationalistic i tried to get them to tone it down but uh they didn't the listen times, to you. the new york times gave it a review actually and it was gave, gave it a very good review but it did say that they tended to over dramatize these infections and of course they do because they want you to think the whole world is going to collapse around you once you catch it and Gee, that's unusual. Yeah, right. Right. Exactly. Okay, everyone. Thanks for listening. Go subscribe on iTunes. Leave some comments. Go to our website, twiv.tv. You've been listening to This Week in Virology, all about viruses. We'll see you next week. Another Twiv is viral. <laughs>